The question that came in had to do with mining. We saw with Martin's example there, a river channel. Do you see any differences to those figures that were presented when you're analyzing a mining pit? What if that was just a really, really deep hole? Would it look the same? Do those same principles apply whether you've got a river sucking the water out of the system or whether you've got a mining pit uh, that's being pumped out? Any yeah. applications there from your background that you wanted to share with us? Yeah, if you have open pit mining, I guess it, it would depend if the pit itself will become a terminal sink or not. And what I mean by terminal sink is whether water will flow back into the pit or will it be a flow through pit where it will just continue to flow through like Martin showed in his example, and it would continue to go to the discharge point, which is a river. You assess that typically through predictive numerical modeling and look and kind of calculate a new quasi steady state once you stopped mining and look at the recovery periods. So yeah, it's very applicable, the yeah. first principles that Martin's talking about to mining as well. Well, hello, I am Cray with the International Water Training Institute. And on behalf of the Australian Water School, welcome to the very first free webinar of our 2023 series. Today, we're going back to the basics with groundwater, whether it's new material for you or whether it's a refresher, uh, whether you're a beginner or an experienced modeler, we're hoping that today's content can help fill any gaps that might have come into play since your uh, last university course on the subject. So uh, today we've got a global audience with us. Um, so thank you for everyone for your attendance. Um, for those who are watching on YouTube later on, uh, truly a global spread here from all continents. Uh, if, uh, you know, if groundwater is an issue for you, you know, we're hoping that the content that we give you today can help you wherever you are in the world and thanks especially to those who are joining us uh, in the wee hours on the chat line I can see some people who are joining us at two in the morning um, thanks for your uh, your participation in this and the efforts in uh, sharing this time with us so let's introduce our experts today Martin Hendricks and Guy Rummer Martin helped us out uh, with a couple of courses in the past so we're glad to have him back with us and uh, Guy is his, uh, this is his first uh, appearance here on the Australian Water Schools uh, webinars so to, to both of you, I guess, uh, just if you could give us a brief introduction, uh, where you're coming to us from today, and uh, how long you've been doing, uh, how, how long you've been in the groundwater business. Um, Martin, first to you, and then over to Guy. Well, I'm uh, coming from uh, Abkoude, a little village in between Amsterdam and uh, Utrecht. Uh, basically, I've been working at uh, universities for uh, more than uh, 30 years. I'm uh, retired tired now, and... Uh, I did a lot of uh, lecturing in hydrology, mainly uh, uh, groundwater hydrology. Also, I was involved in landslide research, uh, research uh, uh, linked to climate change. So uh, managed to put up an education system where I uh, would warn the students for the pitfalls of uh, hydrology, because there are uh, many, uh, especially uh, at the beginning. So I'm very pleased that I can uh, give this lecture and uh, take away maybe with the beginners, but it's, it's a very wide audience. There may be people who are uh, really uh, uh, way uh, into groundwater modeling. I don't know. Um, we'll see. But yeah. um, well, we'll, okay. do, we'll have a little bit of a poll, actually, in the meantime, so yeah. that'll give us a good feel for what um, uh, what what everybody is, uh, what level everybody's coming to us from. So, the if you if you filled out that poll in the beginning, thank you. Maybe we'll have a, a look at those results while Guy's introducing himself. And uh, Guy, maybe just let us know as you're looking through here if you um, have any surprises. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it looks like uh, we have 31% that have ran groundwater models before, so that's that's exciting for me because I'm a groundwater modeler. So. Um, yeah, so I, I work with Tetra Tech, it's an environmental consultancy firm, uh, pretty global. Um, it was even over in Australia and Perth for a year and a half with Cray. Um, but I've been doing groundwater modeling since uh, my master's degree. Um, I started off at Los Alamos National Laboratory doing, doing groundwater flow and solute transport modeling for Yucca Mountain, the, uh, which was the proposed uh, high level waste you know, nuclear repository in the States. Um, and then I started with Tetra Tech in 1999, and I've been doing groundwater modeling ever since, um, mainly for um, commercial uh, industry. So for mines, uh, oil and gas, um, contaminated sites, um, you name it. I've probably touched it at some point in the last 25, 26 years. 
Excellent. All right. Now, while Martin's getting ready to share his screen, uh, Martin will be our main presenter today. But um, I wanted to just mention that, um, you know, this year uh, for our 2023 webinars, we're going to try to continue to build on some of our key disciplines, you know, groundwater, surface water, water quality. Um, we're going to be bringing you a whole range of new topics, uh, tidal energy, wind and wave forces, desalination. Uh, but we're also going to try to continue to expand some of our most popular previous topics um, with new webinars and courses that are going to cover QGIS and HECRAS, ModFlow, and some of the practical applications. Um, we do try to balance a bit of the theory with the practical side of things. Um, so you'll, I, I hope you get a feel for that today. So stay tuned for the registration links for some of those upcoming webinars. We'll provide those at the end today. And um, even though there are some gaps in this year's schedule, they're uh, filling up quickly, but we still have some opportunities to incorporate other topics that you may want to hear about. So do not uh, go, do not exit this webinar without giving us your feedback and let us know what you want to hear about. So on to today's topic. Um, we are really excited to be introducing a new course called Groundwater Essentials. Um, last year, with, with uh, Martin's help as well, um, we developed a course covering the essential principles of surface water, hydrology, and hydraulics. That's now available for on-demand registration. And we're we're going to continue that series with a groundwater essentials course that starts next month. And so as an introduction to that course today, um, this is a free webinar um, that uh, actually launches that course. And we're going to meet uh, uh, Martin as one of the key uh, instructors of that course. And we'll kick that off um, with this free webinar that covers some of the most fundamental principles uh, involved in groundwater hydrology. So um, with that, um, uh, Dr. Hendricks is joining us uh, in the late hours of uh, in, in the Netherlands. So with that, I'll turn my camera off. Over to you, Dr. Hendricks. Well, thank you, Craig. And uh, everybody, uh, welcome to this uh, lecture on groundwater with uh, Darcy and uh, Bernoulli. Darcy lived in the uh, 19th century and Bernoulli in the 18th century. And uh, understanding uh, the equations or laws that they derived is fundamental to understanding groundwater hydrology. Well, first of all, groundwater is important as effluent seepage, uh, seepage leaving a groundwater body that uh, feeds streams, rivers, wetlands, and lakes. It's important for agriculture, the growth of crops, as an often clean source for drinking water and for uh, many industrial uh, activities and for the sustainment of uh, biodiversity in groundwater dependent ecosystems. Groundwater is a valuable resource that needs to be protected from pollution and over exploitation. Let's start off with a little quiz, a multiple choice question. By law of nature, water flows from a higher to a lower A elevation. Is that the right answer? Or is the right answer, by law of nature, water flows from a higher to a lower B energy? Or does water by law of nature flow from a higher to a lower water pressure? Or are D, all of the above options true? Think about this. To start off, we first need to explain the uh, positioning of the water table in easy terms. If you were able to dig a large pit, the level to which the water from the ground rises in that pit is called the water table. The water table is in between the unsaturated zone with soil water, water and air in the pores and the saturated zone or groundwater, water in the pores, fully saturated water. A water table that can establish itself freely is by definition the level at which the pore water pressure in the ground equals the air pressure of the overlying air. On average, this air pressure is the standard atmospheric pressure of one atmosphere, which is a 1013.25 hectopascal. Instead of using this a little bit awkward standard value as the average water pressure at a free air water interface, such as this water table, it is a common practice to define the water pressure at a free air water interface as zero. Thus, 
the water pressure has a value that should be interpreted with the existing air pressure at the air water interface as a reference. And the zero water pressure means that the water pressure equals the existing air pressure at the air water interface, as I said before. This is what we commonly do in hydrology. We simply denote the water table as having a relative water pressure zero, or in short, as having a water pressure zero. When we move down into the groundwater, we have positive water pressures. And when we move upwards from the water table, we have negative water pressures. This photo shows the model, uh, shows a model between two glass plates. The glass plates are five centimeter apart, and the space between the glass plates is filled with gravel and sand. Gravel and sand. In reality, this makes for sand and clay layers. The model is 75 centimeter high and uh, at the bottom one and a half meter wide. The model is a replica of the subsurface being 80 meter high and 13 kilometer wide. To the left, we have a higher part of the landscape and to the right, we have a lower flat part of the landscape. It rains, as you can see at the top, and water moves out of the model in a small stream in the middle and a river to the right. From the back of the panel, a coloring dye is injected into the system at two locations. This enables us to follow the groundwater flow pathways. The water table is approximately, as I'm indicating now, And uh, the water table, of course, coincides with the surface water level at the stream and uh, at the river. We see that groundwater from the left flows in this manner through these two clay lenses and then into this river. We call this a regional flow line. At the top of the subsurface, we see the movement of the groundwater along a local free line, uh, flow line. Let's take a better look. What do we actually observe? First of all, we see that in this setup of phreatic or unconfined groundwater, as it's called, groundwater flows along curved pathways, be it that the curvature in this model is exaggerated as the vertical height is exaggerated in comparison to the horizontal distance. Secondly, we see at the discharging end of the regional flow line uh, that water flows from a lower to a higher elevation. So there is no problem in that. Rivers may be fed from the groundwater below. Because the column of groundwater is larger when we are deeper down in the subsurface, the water pressure is larger deeper down. Thus, we observe at this discharging end that the groundwater flows from a higher to a lower water pressure. If we look at the recharging end, we see the opposite. Groundwater flows downwards from a lower thus to a higher water pressure. So there's no problem in that too, as well as from a higher to a lower elevation. In conclusion, groundwater can flow from a higher to a lower elevation, from a lower to a higher water pressure, but also from a lower to a higher elevation, from a higher to a lower water pressure. So we now know for sure that two of the options in the multiple choice question, by law of nature, water flows from A, a higher to a lower elevation, and C, from a higher to a lower water pressure, are not true. This also rules out option D. 
all of the given options are true. Thus, by law of nature, water flows from a higher to a lower energy. Answer B. Daniel Bernoulli is a Swiss mathematician and physicist, born, by the way, in the Dutch city of Groningen. And to better understand the physics behind groundwater flow, let's now continue with Bernoulli's principle. Let's first take the example of water flowing through a garden hose. Water mo molecules collide with the inside of the garden hose, building up static pressure. If the water moves slowly, we have many collisions and a higher pressure. If the water moves fast, we have fewer collisions and a lower pressure. In the fluid dynamics, Bernoulli's principle states that an increase in the speed of a fluid, here water, occurs simultaneously with a decrease in static pressure or a decrease in the fluid's potential energy. Another well-known example is provided by air rushing around the wings of an airplane that is speeding up on the runway. The wings upper surfaces are curved, causing the air rushing over the top of the wings to speed up, which decreases the air pressure above the wings. The pressure on the top of the wings then is less than the pressure on the bottom of the wings, and the end effect being that the wings are lifted and that the plane takes off into the sky. Although Bernoulli deduced that pressure decreases when the flow speed increases, it was Leonard Euler, also a Swiss mathematician and physicist, who derived Bernoulli's equation or law as we know it. A water particle moving along a streamline possesses three interchangeable types of mechanical energy, all in joule, kinetic energy, potential energy, and pressure energy. M is the mass of the water in kilogram, small v is the velocity in meter per second, g is the acceleration due to gravity in meter per second squared, z is the elevation in meter, and p is the pressure in joule, per cubic meter or Newton per square meter, and large V is the volume of the water in cubic meter. If there is no loss of mechanical energy due to friction, and if we take water as incompressible, then Bernoulli's law for steady flow states that the sum of these three interchangeable types of mechanical energy is constant. A notion also known as conservation of energy, and Bernoulli's law is also sometimes referred to as the energy equation. As flow velocities in groundwater are observed to be very slow, I'll come back to this later, the first term, the kinetic energy may be neglected, and thus for groundwater, mgz plus pv is constant. By dividing all terms to the left and the right of the equal sign by the volume, large V, we obtain an expression per unit volume of the water. Mass M divided by large V becomes density, rho, so rho GZ plus P is constant. Because fresh water has a constant density of a thousand kilogram per cubic meter, we can also divide by the density. And because G, the acceleration due to gravity at a certain location is also constant, we can also divide by G. This delivers the following equation. Z plus P divided by rho G is constant, in which all mechanical energy terms are presented in the length unit of meter. Z is called the elevation head. P divided by rho G is the pressure head. And the constant length unit to the right of the equal sign is the total energy with the length unit, the hydraulic head. We can quite 
easily measure the hydraulic head by using a so-called piezometer, which is a tube often made of PVC with a diameter of 20 to 50 millimeter and with a short screen of 10 to 30 centimeter length at the bottom, placed under the water table through which groundwater enters the tube. Groundwater can only flow into the piezometer through the screen at the bottom of the tube. The hydraulic head is thus measured at the location of the piezometer screen. Z is the altitude of the screen above the reference level in meter. P divided by rho g is the water pressure above the screen in meter. And by adding Z and P divided by rho g together, we obtain the hydraulic head in meter. The total energy as a length unit at the position of the screen. In this figure, we see a phreatic or unconfined local groundwater flow system in cross section. Here we have the surface of the land, the water table, and a river or canal. And two pairs of piezometers at these two locations with their screens at different depths. If we take the bottom of this picture, as our uh, reference level, the hydraulic head measured at this piezometer screen is simply this height, which I'm indicating with the pointer. And the hydraulic head at this piezometer screen is simply this height. So we have a higher hydraulic head here than here but we also have a higher hydraulic head here than here. So water is flowing downwards here and upwards here. Of course, with this right pair of pizometers, you must take care that there is no leakage from the water in the river or canal alongside the tubes. Important to mention is that for measuring a hydraulic head at the location of a piezometer screen, we must use a piezometer with a short screen, whilst for measuring the position of a free water table in a tube to mimic the level to which groundwater would rise in a large open pit. Remember the earlier slide, a tube should be used that is perforated, thus acting as a screen all the way from bottom to top. If we were to install more piezometers, we could establish these streamlines of the groundwater. Here it's recharging and here it's discharging into the river or canal, as well as the broken lines, which are lines of equal total energy or hydraulic head. These so-called equipotential lines are perpendicular to the flow lines for steady groundwater flow which is defined as groundwater flow for which the flow velocity components at any location do not change with time. So this is a higher hydraulic head. This is a lower hydraulic head, and this is an even lower hydraulic head, etc. Again, the water always flows in the direction of the lower total energy, the lower hydraulic head. And this is the end of part one. So I'll tune back to Craig. Sure. Yes, um, we'll have uh, a follow up to that. That was, uh, again, going back to the basics. We want to make sure that um, when we start a course like our Groundwater Essentials course, that um, everybody's got the uh, the same information going forward. And um, this is uh, where it all begins um, with groundwater. Um, Guy, if you wouldn't mind turning on your camera as well, just maybe to um, uh, highlight that question uh, that, uh, that you've answered in the background. Now, I come from more of a surface water background. And Guy, you've uh, been in the groundwater side of things for a long time. 
time. And a lot of people talk about groundwater, surface water interaction. <laughs> and uh, yeah. uh, on the modeling side of things, that's a bit tough to do. The question that came in had to do with mining. We saw with Martin's example there, a river channel. Do you see any differences to those figures that were presented You know, when you're analyzing a mining pit? What if that was just a really, really deep hole? Would it look the same? Do those same principles apply whether you've got a river sucking the water out of the system or whether you've got a mining pit uh, that's being pumped out? Any yeah. applications there from your background that you wanted to share with us? Yeah, if you have open pit mining, I guess it, it would depend if the pit itself will become a terminal sink or not. And what I mean by terminal sink is whether water will flow back into the pit or will it be a flow through pit where it will just continue to flow through like Martin showed in his example, and it would continue to go to the discharge point, which is a river. You assess that typically through predictive numerical modeling and look and kind of calculate a new quasi steady state once you stopped mining and look at the recovery period. So yeah, it's very, it's very applicable. The yeah. first principles that Martin's talking about to mining as well. Yeah. And uh, so thanks for those questions. Uh, so again, one of the questions was on uh, groundwater surface water interactions. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but a lot of these same principles in this very beginning part, if you uh, watch some of our introductory lectures on some of those others, uh, you know, Euler and Bernoulli, we, uh, we hit those with our surface water course. Um, we also hit Froude and Manning and others. We've got full webinars uh, covering some of the theory that uh, and, and practical applications that came from some of those other well, well-known names in surface water. And Bernoulli is one that applies to both. Uh, Darcy, on the other hand, which we'll talk about now, is generally uh, somebody that we talk about uh, in terms of groundwater, uh, primarily in groundwater, but uh, we'll see if there's some interaction there as well. So back over to you, uh, Dr. Henderson. Okay, thanks, Gray. Moving on to Darcy's Law, we again start off with a little quiz, uh, especially for all those already familiar or slightly familiar with hydrology, with groundwater hydrology. Which one of the following sentences presents a correct calculation method? There is a, only one correct calculation method. A, the hydraulic conductivity is one centimeter per day. Then groundwater travels one meter in 100 days. Or is it B, the hydraulic conductivity is one centimeter per day and the porosity which is the maximum volume fraction of water in the subsurface is 0.4, then groundwater travels two and a half meter in 100 days. Or is it C, the specific discharge is one centimeter per day, uh, then groundwater travels one meter in 100 days. Or is it D, the specific discharge is one centimeter per day, and the porosity is 0 0.4, then groundwater travels two and a half meter in 100 days. There is only one right option. Which option presents the correct calculation method? If you like, write down the letter of your choice and check later whether it's correct at the end of this lecture. Here we have a cross section of the subsurface of a flat land surface. We have the land surface. The subsurface is made up of well-sorted sand. We have the water table and groundwater above an, uh, a water impermeable layer. Installed into the subsurface are two piezometers and as said before, groundwater can only enter the piezometer tubes through the screens at the bottom. Taking the top of the uh, water impermeable layer as a uh, reference level, we see that the water rises to a lower level in the right piezometer. The right piezometer thus has the lower hydraulic head and groundwater flows in the direction of the lower hydraulic head, thus from left to right. Can we estimate the velocity of the groundwater flow if yes, we can also establish the time it takes for a conservative pollutant at the left piezometer screen to reach the right piezometer screen. A conservative pollutant is a pollutant that does not interact with the ground mass, or in other words, the polluting substance goes with the flow. Again, can we estimate the velocity of the groundwater flow? Yes, we can. And for this, we can make good use of Darcy's law. 
In his uh, original experiments, Darcy used a vertical cylinder filled with water-saturated sand. Darcy's experimental setup is represented here in simplified form by a horizontal cylinder filled with water-saturated sand. The experiment starts after the whole system is filled with water. Note that the screens at both sides uh, keep the sand in place, but that water can pass freely through the screens. If the water levels in the two reservoirs differ, then water will flow through the sand-filled cylinder. The water level in the left reservoir is kept at a constant elevation H1 by letting water spill over the edge. Similarly, the water in the right reservoir, which is recharged uh, by the water moving through the cylinder, is kept at a constant elevation H2. If we were to look at this left screen and uh, establish the hydraulic head at, for instance, the midpoint, then this length is the elevation head and this length is the pressure head. Elevation head plus pressure head gives the hydraulic head H1. Actually, everywhere along the screen, here or here, no matter where we're looking, the hydraulic head is the same. So at every location along the left screen, the hydraulic head equals H1. Similarly, at every location along the right screen, the hydraulic head equals H2. Water flows in the direction of the lower hydraulic head H2 from left to right through the sand-filled cylinder. Once equilibrium has been established and the water flow has become steady, or another word for this, stationary, the volume flux Q or discharge Q, which is the volume of water that moves through any vertical area A per unit of time in cubic meter per day, can simply be measured by collecting the water that spills over the receiving reservoir during a fixed time interval. Note that the area A is perpendicular to the water flow. Let's do a uh, thought experiment. What would happen if we would enlarge the difference between the hydraulic heads H1 and H2? For this, we could raise the le left reservoir to a new fixed higher position or lower the right reservoir to a new fixed lower positions or do both. Intuitively, you would think that the volume flux, or another word for this, the discharge in cubic meter per day would increase. So when H minus H2 increases, Q increases. What would happen if we would diminish the distance X2 minus X1? The length of the porous medium resisting the water flow then diminishes and the discharge would most likely increase. So when X minus X2 minus X1 decreases, Q increases. What would happen if we would enlarge the area A of the cylinder perpendicular to the flow? Then we would also enlarge the pores within this area A through which the water flow actually takes place and the discharge would increase. So when A increases, Q increases. Importantly, please already know that groundwater flow is through the pores and not through the solid substance, the sand particles here. We can now already establish part of Darcy's law. The volume flux or discharge Q through the porous sand material is linearly related to both the difference in hydraulic heads H1 minus H2 and the area perpendicular to the groundwater flow and inversely linearly related to the distance of flow through the porous material X2 minus X1.
Here we have the relation again, but it's, it's not looking very neat because here I have a term with one minus two, and uh, here it's the other way around. The difference in hydraulic head delta H over the cylinder length is defined as the hydraulic head at the water receiving end H2 minus the hydraulic head at the water dispatching end H1, and not the other way around. The distance delta X is defined as the location to which, which water flows X2 minus the location from where it was dispatched X1 and not the other way around. For this horizontal water flow, the distance delta X thus equals X2 minus X1. Following these definitions, we can now rewrite the relation as Q being related to H2 minus H1 divided by X2 minus X1 and this times A. But now, of course, with a minus sign added to the equation. The hydraulic gradient is defined as the difference in hydraulic head, H2 minus H1, over the porous medium, divided by the distance, uh, sorry, is as the difference in hydraulic head, H2 minus H1, over the porous medium, divided by the distance, X2 minus X1, over which this difference in hydraulic head occurs. The hydraulic head is given here as a small i. So Q equals minus the hydraulic gradient I times the area perpendicular to the water flow. Again, regard this area A as a kind of false area, as groundwater flow is not through the area in full, full but only through the pore space part of the area, not through the solid part made up by the sand particles. But still, the equation is not looking very neat. To the left of the uh, equal sign, the volume flux or discharge Q is in cubic meter per day. And to the right of the equal sign, the hydraulic gradient is in meter per meter, so dimensionless. And the area A is in square meter. So we have cubic meter per day to the left and square meter to the right of the equal sign. And thus, we are still missing out on a term in meter per day to the right. This term is the hydraulic conductivity K in meter per day. The hydraulic conductivity is a function of both the properties of the porous medium through which the water flows and the properties of the water itself. Without going into full detail concerning the properties of the porous material, think of, is it sand, loam, clay, or a mix of these? Is the material well sorted or not? For instance, a well sorted sand will have a much higher hydraulic conductivity than a clay. Concerning the properties of the water, think of its temperature, density, and viscosity. For instance, the hydraulic conductivity increases when the water temperature rises. All these properties of both the porous material and the groundwater itself are captured in this hydraulic conductivity K. Our thought experiment has replaced part of the experiments and observations that led Henri Darcy to his law, which is what we now have deduced. The volume flux or discharge large Q is equal to the minus, the, uh, minus K times I times A. However, if you look at literature, you usually find Darcy's law expressed as small q equals, equals minus k times your hydraulic gradient i. Instead of using small i, the hydraulic gradient for horizontal groundwater flow in literature is also given as delta h over delta x, or sometimes as the differential dh dx. Small q is large Q divided by the area A perpendicular to the flow, and thus in meter per day. 
small q in meter per day may be mistaken for a velocity, but remember that groundwater flow is only through the pores of area A and not through the area A in full. Therefore, small q, despite its unit of meter per day, is not a velocity. We call small q the volume flux density or the specific discharge of the groundwater flow. If we want to know the true velocity of the groundwater flowing from X1 to X2, of course, we need to know the porosity, actually the effective porosity. The porosity is usually indicated with small n and is defined as the maximum volume fraction of water in a porous material. A volume fraction is expressed as a number between zero and one. As there, for instance, may be uh, stagnating water in dead end pores in the porous material, the effective porosity, n with subscript E, is defined as the volume fraction of the porous material that participates in the groundwater flow process. As only the pore space within the area A participates in the groundwater flow, this true velocity, which we call the effective groundwater velocity, V with subscript E, must be equal to the volume density, the volume flux density, or specific discharge, small q, divided by the effective porosity. Also, if we were to inject a coloring dye at the left screen here, we could easily estimate the time it would take for this coloring dye to reach the right screen, simply as the distance x2 minus x1 divided by this effective velocity. Let's return to our problem. Can we estimate the velocity of the groundwater flow? As said before, yes, we can, but for this, we need some extra data. The subsurface is made up of a well sorted sand. The hydraulic conductivity K will then be in the order of, let's say, 10 meter per day. We know the difference in hydraulic head to be defined as the lower hydraulic head minus the higher hydraulic head, thus minus one meter here. And this difference in hydraulic head is established over a distance of one kilometer. Hydraulic gradient for this phreatic or unconfined water flow may then be taken as this minus one meter divided by thousand meter, which is 0 0.001. Using Darcy's law, the volume flux density or specific discharge, small q equals minus k times I, the hydraulic gradient, so minus 10 times minus 10 to the power minus three, which gives 10 to the power minus two meter per day, which is one centimeter per day. This, of course, is not yet the velocity. To determine the effective velocity, we need to know the effective porosity, Ne, of the well-sorted sand. Ne of a well-sorted sand can be in the order of 0 0.4. The effective velocity VE is small q divided by NE, which gives 10 to the power minus 2 divided by 0 0.4, which gives 2.5 centimeter per day, which is 2.5 meter in 100 day days. So answer D of the earlier multiple choice question. For a correct calculation method, you always need to know the porosity, or better, the effective porosity, which was unknown in the earlier multiple choice options A and C. Plus, you need to know the hydraulic gradient, which is incorporated in the specific discharge, but not in the hydraulic conductivity, thereby discarding the earlier multiple choice option B. Two and a half meters in 100 days is nine meter per year, which is less than a kilometer in a century. Actually, the time it takes for a conservative pollutant at the left pizzometer screen to reach the right pizzometer screen 
is equal to the distance of a thousand meter divided by two and a half times 10 to the power minus two meter per day, which gives 40,000 days or more than 109 years. And less than one kilometer in a century amounts to a mere stretch of 10 kilometer in 1100 years. Thus, groundwater, with some exceptions, for instance, in karst areas or when pumped, flows very slowly. And the energy related to the water's velocity, the kinetic energy, therefore, did not need to be considered earlier when using Bernoulli's law for groundwater flow. As a side remark, in surface water flow, which is rapid flow and may even be turbulent, evidently, the kinetic energy does need to be considered and can then, in a similar fashion as with the other energy terms shown before, be rewritten to a length unit called the velocity head. To finalize, we have observed that unconfined groundwater can flow along curved pathways. We know that groundwater flows in the direction of a lower total energy, a lower hydraulic head, and thirdly, as just deduced, groundwater generally flows very slowly. Also, the minus sign in Darcy's law, as well as the differences between specific discharge, being a volume flux density, and the hydraulic conductivity, and the effective velocity, all in units of meter per day, have been explained. This lecture introduced groundwater hydrology, so there is much more. Very important in mastering hydrology, in mastering groundwater hydrology, is that you have to struggle with exercises. I wish you success with all your future <laughs> hydrological endeavors. And that's the end of part two. <laughs> Great. Um, and we might have some advice about entering confined spaces here. Now, we've got um, about uh -huh. 10 minutes to go. Thanks so much for that, Dr. Hendricks. Um, again, uh, what happens here when we go back to basics, hopefully when you go all the way back to basics, um, there may be some things that are very clear to you. What we generally find is at some point, we, uh, we, we lose it, okay? We'll keep up, we'll keep up, and we'll say, okay, I've got that, I've got that, I've got that, and then boom, there's some point where uh, the lecturer or the class gets ahead of you and you've got to go back and, and figure things out. And that's the whole point um, when we come in and do uh, this Groundwater Essentials course. We want to make sure that everybody keeps up and then when we get to certain points, there will be exercises where you've got to practice it and you've got to demonstrate uh, you know, that, that, uh, you know, that, that, that you're keeping up with these uh, concepts uh, to be able to get into the next one. Because once you get behind and uh, the lecturer starts going over your head, um, you may as well just stop and try and figure it out from there. So I hope you've got a feel a little bit for um, how these courses are going to proceed um, as we go forward um, in March. But also in the meantime, let's have a look at some of these uh, questions that have come in on the Q&A line. Now, Guy has uh, frantically been answering uh, some questions there. There have been some great questions. Let's start with just one that relates to the surface water people who are on board. We've got about a third in each category, according to the poll results. Um, so one that uh, would apply to everybody is when can friction be ignored? We talked about that in the very beginning. Um, hey, let's ignore friction and uh, move into this. Um, Guy, I think you had a, an answer on that one. Um, anything you wanted to share with the uh, audience on that response? Well, the, yeah, the actual question was, is there an example where friction loss is zero? Yes. So, and, I, and I couldn't think of one off the top of my head, so maybe Martin can think of one. Um, but yeah, there's clearly always, in real life, there's going to be friction between the water molecules at the molecular level. There's going to be friction yeah. between the water hitting pores, you know, at, you know, in the porous media. So, um, I, but I can't think of a, an example where it's zero. Now, th this is the typical difference between reality and a model. Uh, yeah. In reality, there is friction, but uh, yes. very often we say there is no friction also in surface water hydrology. And when you say there is no friction, you can say that the total energy at two different points, which are not that far apart, is the same. And you can make calculations based on that. So that's, uh, that's, that's very common in surface water hydrology. And uh, well, in groundwater hydrology, uh, uh, maybe, yeah, there are, there's a, a, a difference between reality and the model also. But um, yeah. usually 
the the uh, assumptions we make in our model, they are uh, they are quite sound, and, and the answers uh, are not far off. Yeah, and especially in a numerical model where you have a very fine network, then you can really uh, come to good answers. Yeah. By the way, in the course we'll be dealing with uh, kind of uh, groundwater hydraulics, analytical uh, groundwater hydrology, and that's especially valuable as um, analytical groundwater hydrology gives you easy methods to make a, a kind of crude calculation. So then you know in what kind of order your outcome from your numerical model should lie. It's, it's very important, especially in that sense. Yeah. And one of the things we want to do is take away the mystery of the black box. That's what we try to do in our surface water course with like Manning's coefficients and things like that. So the K value, you know, we hope with lectures like this, that when you start plugging things into models, um, you know, the porosity or whatever else you're plugging in, um, that there's an understanding of where that comes from and how it figures in to the equations. Now, somebody had a, a pretty intuitive question here. Um, Martin, when you put up that uh, that that picture of the uh, piezometer and you said it's only screened from the bottom, um, then somebody asked the question, well, what if it was screened all the way? What if you uh, perforated yeah. the entire thing? Um, Guy, That's you had good. an answer to that uh, one as well on the uh, in, in, in the chat line. So, um, uh, Guy, maybe just state your answer and then, Martin, you can fill, follow up on that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think they were talking about, yeah, full length screen in the confined aquifer versus one just screened over the top. Um, you know, and I was just talking about the difference between partial penetrating wells and fully penetrating wells. And typically partial penetrating well, you'll, you'll yeah. induce more drawdown in the aquifer was what my answer was. But go ahead, Martin. Yeah, that's true. Maybe some, uh, some people have also noticed that in the first part of my uh, talk, uh, I have a picture here. Can I start it's, sharing? Uh, you can start sharing picture? again and put it back up if you've got that. Where is, uh, yeah. Um, uh, while, while we're doing that, I'm, I'm also mentioned then um, that uh, if you are interested in groundwater contaminant transport, so we did talk about those plumes going through, um, we're going to have this next course is going to be handling um, groundwater hydrology and hydraulics. Um, we're, later on in this year, we're going to follow up with uh, full water quality um, uh, essentials courses in both surface water and groundwater. So if you're interested in contaminants, stay tuned. Um, it won't be part of this uh, March course, but we are going to cover that um, in, in the future. So I can see your picture now if you want to talk to that one. Dr. Yeah, but but to to um, continue what Guy was saying, um, uh, the difference between partial penetrating canal, then you get these curved flow lines. If you have a fully penetrating canal, which is a canal which goes all the way to the uh, lower lying uh, water impermeable layer, then your groundwater flow becomes more horizontal. So maybe some people have also noticed that at the beginning of my talk, I had a curved water table in part one and in part two my water table was quite straight which is actually a kind of uh, which is not not totally truthful because there it is also curved we can, but we can make our calculations as if that groundwater flow is horizontal but to come back to um, to the question of what if the uh, the whole tube was uh, perforated then you would measure the water table actually so you can see, for instance, in this uh, right picture, which is a common picture in the uh, Dutch polder where I live, if you have your screen deeper down, you have a higher hydraulic head than when your screen is higher up. So water is flowing upwards. And in the recharge area, you have the opposite, where you have the higher hydraulic head here and uh, the lower hydraulic head here. Now, where would um the water table B, uh, the water table here would uh, probably be because if, if I put my screen here, I would find an even lower position because water is moving upward. So the water table would probably be somewhere here. And you can measure the water table if you put your pizometer screen exactly at the position where the water table is. But that is, of course, a bit ridiculous. Uh, uh, the more common way to measure it is to have a, a tube which is perforated all the way down. So it's it's one big screen in yeah. reality. Excellent. Maybe one final question. Uh, just get your comments um, on on some of the discussion that went back and forth on the Q and A line um, dealt with um, with the uh, confined versus unconfined aquifers and how you could tell. Now with that 
picture you had up there with those tubes going straight down, you know, all we got to do to look at surface water where, um, you know, where velocity head does become important is we just curve that tube at the bottom, point it like a pitot tube into the flow, and then we raise up by that velocity head. So there are a lot of these concepts that we're seeing here, um, you know, that, that uh, do go back and forth between uh, surface water and groundwater and, and the principles that we cover. So um, maybe first guy and then um, follow up with a final answer from Dr. Hendricks here on the questions that came in uh, regarding uh, confined aquifers, you know, how, what would the signs be? How would you, how would you be able to tell if you start, you know, punching holes in the ground, how can you tell if it was a confined aquifer? So guy first, and then over to Dr. Hendricks. Yeah. And I, and I was answering just in a, you know, typical sense there. And some people, you know, chimed in with some very specific uh, examples, but, um, <laughs> but, you know, typically, you know, you install it, you install a well or a piezometer, um, you know, you measure that hydraulic head that was discussed in this sem in the seminar, and you 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 compare it to the top of the aquifer, and you see if there's you know if it's under confining conditions or not. I mean, that's in the most general, typical sense. Now, there's obviously some exceptions, but you know that is you know typically you find that it's the pressure at depth is higher than it is, you know, more shallow, so it's under confining conditions. Or if the well flows, then you have artesian conditions, and you definitely know it's confined. Yes. So. You know, that's another yeah. example. So, yeah. And also, the relation you find between the uh, pitometers is a linear relation because uh, that's mm -hmm. in confined groundwater. Yeah. It's, it's actually the most easy, easiest case to model confined groundwater flow. We'll, in the course, we'll start off with uh, confined groundwater. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, groundwater models can, yeah, converge yeah. a lot if you're under confined conditions and unconfined. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, we'll have uh, some practical examples for you in the course. We'll also follow up with additional webinars um, that cover, you know, groundwater and contaminant transport and some things like that. Um, and we will respond to uh, your further uh, questions and feedback as well. So thanks to everyone who joined us. Um, thanks especially to Dr. Hendricks for coming on at the late wee hours of the night uh, in the Netherlands. Um, we try to get uh, an international focus for these uh, and perspective for these uh, courses and for all of our our webinars and you know for something like this uh, it's obvious from a lecture like today uh, why you can receive certificates of attendance so if you need registration uh, support uh, and things like that for your uh, certifications and your licensing um, you can earn those by attending these uh, webinars and uh, and these courses um, and you know in, in some cases uh, you know this is like going going back to school for me that's a bit of a refresher my last groundwater groundwater course was probably 25 years ago but I deal with groundwater on a daily basis it's sometimes it's inflow sometimes it's outflow from my surface water models but we've all got to interact so we want to promote the uh, groundwater surface water interaction realm whether our models are good at doing that or not um, we want to make sure that we're accounting for all of the principles uh, that we need to know about um, when we start opening models and throwing numbers into these variables uh, we want to make sure we've taken away the mystery of the black box so thanks so much for your attendance you'll see a couple of links here come up for some future courses and webinars um do uh, you know uh promote these in your social networks if you can um we uh, like to bring you the content uh, the best content that we can and the most relevant content to your work um so thanks so much for everybody for attending uh thanks uh, maybe i'll let you guys just give your final uh, goodbyes and uh closing remarks here um but thanks uh, you know the, these these uh lecturers and presenters and panelists come on um you know as as volunteers um you know we're, we're interested in furthering the industry here but um you know our feedback from you is the pay that we get for uh for our time spent here with you and we do value that and um you know it, it is something that um you know we we, we like to uh, promote uh, going forward um you know this this contact with the industry so um guy closing remarks and then over to martin to close it off for us yeah just as a groundwater modeler i'd like to say you know if when your model is not doing what you think it's doing you always go back to first principles like this in the conceptual model and see if something is not correct so it's it's an important <laughs> foundation to to establish Good advice. Good advice. Yeah. Well, uh, bring it home for good, us, uh, Dr. Hendricks. Well, that's a uh, very good advice. Uh, and uh, in the beginning, uh, take away the uh, the pitfalls in hydrology. Sounds good. That's, <laughs> <laughs> enjoy doing okay. the exercises. Sounds Probably good. Yeah. Okay. Well, th thanks so much, everybody, for attending. Uh, we will see you next time with the Australian Water School. Bye bye.